Hello, this is David Lee from Prevent Connect, and welcome to today's web conference that Prevent Connect is co-sponsoring with Heal Trafficking, Public Health Approach to Preventing Human Trafficking. I'm really pleased to see so many people joining us throughout the country. Prevent Connect is a national project. The California Coalition Against Sexual Assault is sponsored by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The views and information presented in the Prevent Connect activities do not necessarily necessarily represent the official views of the United States government, the CDC, or CalCASA. For more information, please visit preventconnect.org. It's really a pleasure to be here today. I am um, hosting and facilitating today's session um, with Hani Stoklosa from Heal Trafficking. How are you doing, Hani? Hi, David. I'm doing good. Yeah, we are actually both in Boston today, I'm, but at different locations. Um, I'm sorry uh, to take you from your warmer climate. Well, I, it is warmer there, but it's great to be here in Boston where there's still snow on the ground. Um, this is a really wonderful opportunity that came up, and, honey, I'm really glad that we got a chance to get to know each other and work together to be able to bring this session, which I think is such an important topic for us who are discussing prevention work. Um, and what we're going to do in today's session is have these following objectives. We want to be able to introduce the essential elements of human trafficking as a public health issue as opposed to a criminal justice perspective. We're going to articulate the problematic and complex nature of human trafficking that would intersect with sexual and domestic violence and primary prevention programs. And I think a real key to this is we're going to provide examples of community health organizations engaged in preventing both labor and sex trafficking, lessons learned and successes. And we're looking for everyone here to be able to describe actionable steps and measures to prevent trafficking within your own communities. Today, we're going to start with an overview. We will talk about a preventing from a hearing um, from Melissa from the from this. So actually, we'll hear from uh, about preventing public health from a preventing from a public health perspective. We'll be talking a bit more specific about labor trafficking and sex trafficking. Getting some examples on community health and prevention, and then we're going to ask you all to think about your takeaway message about what actions you will be able to take. So this um, part of what this web conference is, um, we had learned that there was this um, book that was just released um, just a few months ago, um, and Hani, you were one of the editors of this book, Human Trafficking is a Public Health Issue, a Paradigm Expansion in the United States, and it was great to see this book out. Um, while we're not going to talk about the book in Specifically, um, it sort of spurred us to be able to say this is a great chance to share experiences about um, doing prevention work around human trafficking and how that ties into our other prevention efforts. So it's really great to be able to have all of you being able to join um, here. And so, um, Connie, why don't you uh, talk a little bit about heel trafficking and sort of give an overview of this topic? Great. Thanks so much, David. Heal Trafficking is so thrilled to be able to co-host this webinar, um, so thanks for the opportunity. And um, just a little bit about us for everyone in the audience. We were founded in the fall of 2013. We're a united network of over now 800 multidisciplinary professionals dedicated to healing the world of trafficking through a public health lens. Our work spans research, education and training, protocol development, direct services, advocacy, media and technology all really with the goal of shifting the frame of trafficking response to a public health lens. And I'm trying to click forward. You should see the arrow right up there. Go ahead and click on it. There I we go, perfect. There. Um, so this is just a diagram to illustrate how I think of trafficking as it intersects with other forms of interpersonal violence. Um, you know, we know throughout an individual's lifespan that some some folks will experience various forms of violence, that an early experience of abuse may pave the way for future exploitation, and that sometimes these forms of violence may also be co-occurring. Um, moreover, as an emergency medicine physician, I see patients who are, in fact, survivors of trafficking who will sometimes use these other labels of sexual assault or intimate partner violence to describe their experiences. But in terms of the context of our discussion here today about prevention, many of these forms of violence may have common upstream pathways, and we can learn from the foundation of prevention interventions and research that has been laid by those working for years to combat other forms of violence. I know that Melissa from the CDC will be touching on this a little. We know that we cannot arrest our way out of trafficking and that it's critical to have a public health response. So definitions. To take a step back for a moment, 
and recognizing that we have a diverse audience, I want to make sure folks on the webinar know that what it is we're referring to uh, when we're talking about trafficking. Thank you, Jean, for the slide. So U.S. law divides trafficking into sex and labor trafficking. It's defined in terms of the actions of the traffickers exploiting a victim, including recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person. I'm going to start off with sex trafficking, as there's an important age cutoff here. So anyone under the age of 18 exploited in commercial sex is considered to be trafficked by U.S. law. Then 18 or over, and for labor trafficking, there has to be an element of force, fraud, or coercion. That force, fraud, or coercion often takes the forms of invisible chains, including threats, imposed debts, physical or emotional violence, drug addiction, and often occurs, unfortunately, in multiple forms. Gene of the Freedom Network is going to go into more detail later about the various sectors affected, but in general, we see trafficking in industries that are underregulated and underpaid, including restaurant work, agriculture work, nail salons, et cetera. Importantly, Trafficking does not require movement, and someone may be trafficked in their own home. Just as trafficking itself is a complex, heterogeneous phenomena and really affects a variety of races, genders, socioeconomic classes, races, and ethnicities, the risk factors for trafficking are myriad, and a public health lens allows us to examine them on an individual, relationship, community, and societal level. This diagram from the Institute of Medicine report is just one framing of these risk factors as it focuses on a narrow subsection of trafficking, the trafficking minors in the United States. Melissa from the CDC is going to be going over this in more detail. Finally, for those of you on the webinar in the healthcare sector, I just wanted to let the, you all know about a newly released and free HEAL protocol toolkit. We feel it's critical for health systems to develop plans for caring for patients who are trafficking survivors or at risk of trafficking. These patients are the most vulnerable of the vulnerable, and it's critical that their care be standardized and thoughtful and not ad hoc. This cool toolkit walks one through the steps for protocol development in a healthcare setting from A to Z, from stakeholder engagement all the way through to monitoring and evaluation. Uh, to get your copy, you can click on that link below. Um, and we also enjoin you all, um, uh, encourage you all to join our network. Um, just go to healtrafficking.org. United, we can heal the world of trafficking. So, Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, honey. Let's go ahead and ask some uh, questions of the audience. I want to get a sense from you in the audience. Why is it important to address ending human trafficking in your communities? From your experiences, why is it important to address ending human trafficking in your communities? So I want to go ahead, and people are going to start. Um, Megna will probably be writing this question down in a moment in the text chat, but go ahead in the text chat, in the lo you'll appear in the lower right-hand corner, go ahead and write down why is it important to be able to address that. Um, and the first response is, and we'll be talking about this later, it violates human rights. And we'll be talking about a human rights perspective. And I think it's really important for us as we look at these issues of what we can go um Many fo folks are service providers. Um, the same clients don't know what to look at. It addresses um, health issues, um, human dignity to prevent sexual assaults. It's a silent issue that people don't talk about, a crime against humanity, a mediator to many health outcomes, because we're working with survivors and want to end this. Um, it is happening in our community. To best stress the needs of per persons who look for our services, there's so many vulnerable youth um, at risk, there's very low awareness of it because human trafficking affects all, um, every level of our community. We're seeing victimizations to human trafficking within our sexual assault services clients. To change the culture, the way the, way the culture um, people view survivors. And as nurses, we're seeing patients without seeing or knowing addressing the human trafficking concerns and to protect others and to be able to um, because it creates a lifetime trauma. So, honey, I'm seeing a lot of people's recognition that this is a serious problem that's happening in their communities that often people aren't aware of and they're not aware mm -hmm. of the resources and sometimes that, and it's often hidden. And that from I for me, I think from a prevention perspective, the some of the forces that the forces that create human trafficking are the same forces that also create um, other forms of violence. And by addressing those, we can be able to really address human human um, trafficking. 
Indeed. Any thoughts you have, There's Todd? so much yeah. intersectionality. Great. Well, that's wonderful to see so much from our audience. So, um, Holly, why don't you introduce who our speakers are going to be today? Thanks, David. It should be noted first that these presentations that follow, while hosted by Heal and Prevent Connect, um, are the individual work of the, the speakers themselves. I am so pleased to have an esteemed group of presenters who, in their day-to-day -day work, are working tirelessly to prevent trafficking. We're really hopeful that today's se session will help cement trafficking as a public health issue further in all of your minds, as David was saying, and ultimately that you'll, you'll see these examples of primary prevention and consider how you and your organizations may incorporate work that prevents trafficking. We're thrilled to have Melissa Merrick from the CDC, Jean Brueggemann of the Freedom Network, Kimberly Chang of Asian Health Services, Rumini Hung of Bonte Shrey, so without any further ado, let's hear from our first panelist, Melissa Merrick of the CDC. Hi there, thanks for having me today. Um, I'm just delighted to be here to share a little bit about the public health impact of early adversity, which of course includes um, child sex trafficking. So without um, belaboring the point, I should say that I, uh, my specialty, my expertise is in child abuse and neglect prevention, but just as the honey, the, the slide that honey shared of the various across the social ecology, the, the various risk factors, we see that child abuse and neglect and other forms of family violence are very robust risk factors for multiple forms of violence and victimization experiences, including um, sex trafficking um, and even labor trafficking. So I would just like to start with this um, YouTube video that really comes from the same Institute of Medicine and National Resource Council 2013 report that really clearly outlines that commercial sexual exploitation of children is not just a risk factor of child abuse, but is itself a form of child abuse. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and start this video. It should be appearing on your screen. And the sound is... The sound should be coming through your computer.
Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead and close the um, and close this. That um, for that. Thank you, Melissa, for introducing. I think this video. We did put the URL for those of you who are unable to. Um, and Megna, can you please try to close? There, I was able to. Ask. Great. So, Melissa, back to you. Great. Thanks, David. And I see some of the comments. You all are um, very astute, and this obviously is, a, is focused on commercial sexual exploitation of children as child abuse, but I would agree with many of your comments that labor trafficking of children is also child abuse. Um, and so with that in mind, I would just like to start by talking about violence in the broader public health context. We know that youth exposed to violence experience multiple and long-lasting health consequences and that there is a very robust association between violence exposure and experiences and um, violence exposure okay. and experiences. Excuse me, Melissa, excuse me for a second. We seem to have an audio problem. I'm hearing you uh -oh, loud okay. and clear, um, but some people have lost their audio. Um, uh -oh. And so we are going to ask give people a chance to call in. I think that's probably on the computer. They might have lost the, the audio with the other piece. I'm just checking this here, um, and Megna is trying to um, do this. I am here. It was after the video that there was a small problem, and so I'm going to give people a chance to go ahead, and Megna is going to write again in that if they're having trouble with the audio to call in, I think that's for those who are on the computer that were having the problem. So just give us a moment, Melissa. With technology is great when it works. Yeah, <laughs> totally. And when it doesn't, we um, are going to be able to do this, but I appear to be um, moving here, but I'm hearing you loud and clear, so I think that, that we are um, being able to see this. Um, okay, and now it is gone, um, and we are talking, and we can hear this. Um, so I'm hoping people are calling in and able to get this. So I apologize for that. Um, so let's go ahead and um, I am unclear because I definitely am hearing you. Okay. For audio, please call in again. So we're just going to wait till we get. Um, and that seems to be the problem that we are having, so we should get there shortly. Calling in works, according to Judy, so that's great. We are getting there. Um, so thank you, Melissa. We're just going to give a moment for people to be able to get their audio. I think we seem to have had a problem with the um, – once when we did the um, video that it seemed to have disappeared afterwards. Okay, Melissa, why don't we go ahead now, um, and you can start um, with this here. Sure. Thanks, David. So, yeah, technology is great until it doesn't work for us. But um, basically all I was saying for those who have just joined back in is that um, this video, I think, is very clear. It's, it's showcasing that um, child abuse and neglect is not just a risk factor for um, the exploitation of children, but also um, it is itself a form of child abuse. And as many people um, acknowledge, labor trafficking of minors would also constitute an early adversity. So what I'd like to share is just let me know about why early adversity is a strategic, um, actionable public health problem. So here on this slide, you can see that um, youth exposed to violence experience multiple and long-lasting health consequences, including non-communicable diseases and infectious diseases. So as a society, we would really be remiss not to consider early adversity, such as child abuse and neglect, and certainly commercial sexual exploitation of children, for example, in the prevention of both infectious and non-communicable diseases. And the early years of life matter in large part because early experiences, both positive and negative, really affect the architecture of the maturing brain. So just like when you're building a house, if you skip the foundation, your house won't be sturdy. The same thing happens in brain development. Children's brains are really built, built in this sequential fashion, and if you skip a step or if the process is impacted by trauma like violence, like commercial sexual exploitation, then children will have a weaker foundation for all their future development and growth. And we know that certain experiences like violence and other early adversity can really compromise the way the brain develops. 
So excessive, repeated toxic stress can impair cell growth. It can interfere with the formation of healthy neural circuits, and it can really contribute to premature aging of the body. And one major example of early experiences that really impact optimal healthy growth and development is child abuse and neglect. Yet when most people think about child abuse and neglect, they picture images such as these, mostly the physical injuries like bruises or broken bones. Maybe they think about some mental health concerns like some depression. But usually they don't picture these sorts of images, chronic diseases like uh, heart disease, stroke, diabetes, academic achievement pro problems. But we know there's a very robust literature that child abuse and neglect and other forms of early adversity can literally make us sick. Great. So, so um, Melissa, oh, let's, let's, before we do that, Melissa, let's ask a question of our audience. And I'm going to do this in the left-hand corner. Go ahead. Have you heard of or read about the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study? So it's ACEs. So in the left-hand corner, go ahead and just check. So most of us just going to see how much of our audience. And um, I, I'm thinking one of our speakers has a child nearby um, or someone. So if you can, thank you. Um, so go ahead. And Melissa, if you notice, of our audience, of those who have answered the question, I'm going to share the results. Um, over three-quarters of our audience are familiar with ACEs, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. Terrific. Great. So I will not review this in detail um, since most of you know very well, and I will just try to summarize the collection of efforts and results um, that have, have happened in the ACE field. But the original ACE study really started as a collaboration between CDC and Kaiser Permanente. At that time, when this started in the late 90s, um, it was really in our Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion where this work sat. And in 2012, it did mo move over to the National um, Center for Injury Prevention and Control, um, where I am the lead scientist here um, in the Division of Violence Prevention on this ACE work. But really, the original work was really about this retrospective cohort of an HMO population, so people that came in for their well visits basically retrospectively reported about experiences that they may have experienced under the age of 18. And here you can see a graphic of what those original categories of early adversity that were assessed were. So physical abuse, emotional abuse, and sexual abuse, two different forms of neglect, and various forms of family challenges, like growing up with a parent with mental illness or a parent who had been incarcerated. What I hope you see here are some of the limitations of the ACE score, which is literally just a sum of the various categories of experiences. This is by no means the entire universe of early adversity that we know children in our country and certainly abroad also face. So that is one of the limitations. Also, the ACE score is really just the sum of these categories. So what the ACE score doesn't get into is various dimensions of early adversity, like the age of onset, um, who the perpetrator was, um, the frequency. So if you were physically abused one time and that was the only category of um, ACE that you had, your ACE score would be one. If you were physically abused every day for 10 years in your childhood, but it was the only category of ACE, that you had, your ACE score would still be one. So I just think it's really important that folks understand the limitations. That said, this gives us a wealth of information on what was happening when people were growing up, and then we can look at associations with their current health status. I should say, in addition to the original ACE study that had 17,000 HMO recipients, um, there are 39 states and the District of Columbia who have included um, ACE uh, measurement or assessment on their behavioral risk factor surveys. That's their state um, health surveys. Um, and VRFSS uh, questions are similar to the, these original questions, except that they do not assess neglect. With that said, even in the, you know, almost all white, um, mostly high um, income, all uh, pretty well educated, and all insured sample of the original CDC Kaiser sample, over half still reported at least an ACE score of one. And if you had an ACE score of one, you were at least, you were 84% likely to have additional early adversity that you reported. So not just, though, were ACEs common, but ACEs have been found to have a repeated uh, graded dose response effect on outcomes. So here you can see a summary slide or a summary graphic. This has been repeated for over 40 health outcomes. So as your number of early adversities um, go up on the x-axis, 
so too does your risk for a whole host of health problems. So health problems such as obesity, diabetes, depression, also health risk behaviors like smoking, alcoholism, and drug use. And importantly, most more recent um, analyses that we've done here in the Division of Violence Prevention have really linked early adversity to also decreased life opportunities. So um, these are also important because we know that you know graduating high school, for example, it's associated with um, being protective of our health. So not only are you getting it, you know, these direct effects on, on health um, status, but also on, um, you know, decreasing our buffers for, for good health. Here's just another slide. Some people are more visual. So um, you can see that violence against children is costly and destructive and really touches all these various domains of non-communicable disease, communicable diseases and risk behaviors, maternal and child health outcomes, mental health problems, and certainly injury problems, among many others. Here, yet another way, here is a, a, um, the top 10 leading causes of death in the U.S. in 2014, and in red here, you can see the ones that have um, been associated with early adversity. So for some, though, it's not just that early adversity has an impact across the life course. It's that for so many, early adversity begins in childhood and then continues throughout their life course. And this, of course, has a compounding or cumulative impact on health status. So, for example, Brown and colleagues in a 1998 paper documented a 19-year difference in life expectancy among those who had high versus no ACEs, and high ACEs were measured six or more. 19-year difference in life expectancy is a greater life expectancy inequity than we see for most any other illness, injury, or geographic comparison. And that's why, to echo the words um, that David started out with, the role of public health and violence prevention is really to, to stop it before it occurs. So we're really in the business of primary prevention, so what you see on the left-hand side of your screen, thereby stemming the flow of cases that touch these other systems, like criminal justice, child welfare, and social service. But certainly, primary, secondary, tertiary prevention efforts and trauma-informed and trauma-sensitive trauma response is critic are all critically important. So we all need to be really trying to achieve a comprehensive approach to child abuse and neglect and other violence prevention. So Great. Let's another... um, yeah, wait, wait, one second, Melissa. Let's just ask Karen the audience Johnson, one more time. Karen may help you. Oh, um, hi. I'm sorry that um, can you please, we're on a web conference here, so I don't know how we got on that line. So we're going ahead and asking people if they are familiar with the Essentials for Childhood, another CDC product, and I think I'm sharing this live. So, Melissa, um, sort of the converse of ACEs, while most of our audience was familiar with it, three-quarters of our audience are not familiar with Essentials for Childhood. Yeah, thank you, David, and thank you all. And I, I'm not surprised at that, given that I think only 2% of the participants said that they were really in a child abuse or neglect prevention agency. Um, but Essentials for Childhood, I think, um, if I may, is, is much broader than just child abuse and neglect prevention, but it really is in the spirit of recognizing the shared risk and protective factors that exist um, to really um, determine leader violence and victimization and health um, experiences for children and, and families. So assuring safe, stable, nurturing relationships and environments for all children is CDC's real sort of strategic direction or framework and even vision for children. And it's a mouthful, but we're careful to say all of these words each and every time that we present on this topic because assuring is a very leadership and visionary role, but we feel like as a the premier public health agency for our country, we do need to take a leadership role in this topic. Safety, stability, and nurturing, those are three important, not mutually exclusive, but very important domains um, of relationships. And by relationships, of course, we mean uh, relationships between parents and their children, but we also mean relationships between parents and other adults that can be really um, helpful for their, their children's health and well-being um, and for their own, of course. And by environments, yes, we mean the home, um, you know, the physical environment. We want safe, stable, nurturing environments, community environments, school environments. But here, too, we're also talking about the broader sociopolitical environment because we understand that there are some conditions that support children and families and others that don't. And really for all children is our intentional integration of health equity into this work. 
And Essentials for Childhood, here are the various goal areas that we um, provide um, some assistance um, to, toward achieving. So raising awareness and commitment for safe, stable, nurturing relationships and environments, using data like the ACE data to inform prevention action and really prevention priorities um, in various states and organizations, and then really around creating the context for safe, stable, nurturing relationships and environments through norms change, through programs, and through policies. So Essentials for Childhood, along with being our vision, it's also a funding initiative. There is a funding initiative component um, where there, we have funded five state health departments, and you can see those dates listed here. But what's really exciting, too, is along with the five funded um, health departments, we have over 30 self-supported states that participate in the Essentials for Childhood initiative. So this really just lets us know that this you know, spirit of promoting protective factors for all of our children and working together across sector and with strategic partnerships is really resonating across the country. Um, and finally, I'd like to share just two other tools that we um, at CDC have recently released, and these are called uh, technical packages. So we're doing it in the Division of Violence um, Prevention for all of our topics, but two of the very first ones that were released are our ones um, on preventing child abuse and neglect, and then our one on preventing um, sexual violence, which is on the next slide. So here you can see, and these are all available. You see the link there. They're available free of charge. And what we've really tried to do is take an evidence-based you know, uh, approach and really distill what's the best available evidence for potentially preventing child abuse and neglect. And here you can see that we start with strengthening economic supports for families. And then we go to changing social norms to support parents and positive parenting. And then we go down to intervening to lessen harms and prevent future risks. So what we really intended to do with this and the way that the report is structured and the tool, um, the technical package is structured, is to really start with these approaches that we think have um, the potential for maximum pu public health impact and then going down to the ones that are more taking a trauma-informed um, approach that might be more secondary or tertiary prevention efforts. And here you can see our STOP SV. They have a really good acronym in the sexual violence um, tool uh, technical package. But here you can see their strategies, promoting social norms that protect against violence, teaching skills to prevent sexual violence, providing opportunities to empower support uh, and support girls and women, creating protective environments and supporting victims. So you can see very similar strategies and approaches across the violence topics. And again, that's because in the spirit of connecting the dots, we recognize the shared risk and protective uh, factors that really are at play for assuring health and wellness for all of our, of our children and future parents in this country. Great. Well, thank you, Melissa. So um, you. I think it's really interesting because as you're talking and um, Prevent Connect had an opportunity of when the Stop SV package came out that we worked um, and had um, a web conference on that. And those strategies, I think, really align well for human trafficking. So I'd love to hear in a text chat from all of you, how do you think these public health tools and approaches um, can help to prevent human trafficking? Um, and what we're really doing is thinking about what public health can contribute towards this. And so Negna has actually put information in and how to get um, information on all, all of these packages. But we'd love to hear in the text chat from each of you. So go ahead and write down, how do you think public tools? It's essential. Thank you, Melanie. Um, read them to form the basis of prevention programming strategies. The question was, how do you think pr um, these – oh, this is the question that we're asking you. Um, prevention is the key, and I think that's one of the pieces of what we spend so much time responding, but we need to do this, we need more raising awareness. Educate, educate, educate. We need to reduce harm for children that are more susceptible um, than at the start. So I see a lot about education that's coming up and awareness. I think public health is about going beyond the education and awareness and really thinking about strategies that are going to address the root causes of this and be able to change the conditions that create um, trafficking or other problems, and that um, we need to be able to look at policy work. I think that's a really impeach, you know, the policies that we can do. Um, for health providers to know more about ACEs, to know what they can do within the, how their role, um, to stop the problem upstream, using the metaphor of being able to get some of the changes earlier and being able to support interdisciplinary approaches to prevention. 
I think that's, Melissa, that's I think, an important part of a lot of the work that CDC has been doing is trying to get different sectors to be involved in different prevention efforts. I mean, each of those reports actually talked about sectoral involvement. So with this, I want to be able to move from, thank you, Melissa, and uh, move to Jean um, Rugman. And Jean, it's really a pleasure to have you join. Oh, I'm sorry, I just clicked your one too many times on my computer. Um, oh, did Jean disappear from, oh, here you are. Now you have the podium, Jean. So um, Jean is the Executive Director of Freedom Network USA. So Jean, you have the podium. Great, thank you, David. And thank you, Melissa, for that great overview of um, the public health approach and issues in uh, childhood prevention. Um, you know, as I was thinking in responding to that, that last question that you posed, David, about the importance of it is, um, you know, to me that, that healthy children are stronger and less vulnerable to all sorts of abuse and exploitation. Um, and I think that uh, slide that Hani showed us of the intersections of all those different forms of violence and abuse are, um, you know, is incredibly relevant here. Um, so I'm Jean Brugman. I'm uh, the executive director of Freedom Network, as David mentioned. Um, Freedom Network is a collaboration. It's a network of service providers and individuals across the United States working to address human trafficking here in the United States. Um, and uh, we have been around uh, for, for 16 years, um, starting out as a very uh, informal network of providers sharing resources, and now um, we have 52 members across the country, um, working in 33 different across the U.S. Um, so at Freedom Network, we use what we call a human rights-based approach to human trafficking um, that prioritizes self-determination, choice, and non-judgmental services and support. Um, but as we were preparing for this webinar and in talking with Hani about the public health approach, I think there are um, an extremely large overlap. I don't know, in the Venn diagram I see in my head, it's, you know, maybe 90% is in the middle of an overlap between um, the human rights-based approach and the public health approach, is really looking at um, the needs of victims and survivors, looking at underlying causes, and focusing not just on, um, you know, the aftermath of the crime, of the harm, but the prevention um, and really looking holistically at the issues um, and focusing, you know, as Hani mentioned, we can't arrest our way out of human trafficking. Um, that's something that the Freedom Network uh, agrees with wholeheartedly um, and that we really as a society need to focus our resources on um, prevention activities and on services and support for those affected. Certainly um, investigation and prosecution is an important part of it, but, um, but that you know, we really need to, to heal, um, as, as Hani puts it, our society. Um, and so that's, I think, uh, where this overlap is. Uh, our website's there on the slide. Feel free to check that out um, for more information and resources about our organization, uh, where our members are, to find a member near you, or to find other information resources. Um, at the Freedom Network, as I mentioned, uh, we have members across the country, and just also add, we do address forms of human trafficking uh, with our members. Some of our members specialize in different forms of trafficking or different populations, um, but as a network, we address all forms of human trafficking, uh, all genders and gender expressions, trafficking of people of all ages, youth and adults, um, all types of human trafficking, uh, and, and folks trafficking of both U.S. citizens and foreign nationals. And then I think we wanted to uh, just ask a question of the audience, um, David, as to what level of training folks have already received on labor trafficking. Um, that's something that I think gets a little less uh, attention in the public, and so we just wanted to... Great. So go ahead. And in the lower left-hand corner, you see an A, B, C, D. A is if you had a lot of training. B is if you've had some. C, a little, or D, none. This is my fancy um, scale that we came up with. And I'm going to share the results 
Um, and Gene, we to um, we have about um, none was about a third of our audience, and another third of our audience has had a little, and about um, some is about a quarter of our audience, and there is um, a and only a small segment have had a lot of training around labor trafficking. So it sounds like there's been some exposure, but many people have not received very much exposure. Great. Thank you, David. Um, you know, I'm not surprised. Uh, there is a lot of, um, well, I won't say it. I would say sex trafficking has been getting more attention and more resources lately and uh, uh, more public attention. Um, and so we're going to spend a little bit of time then talking a little more about labor trafficking um, just to sort of bring you all up to speed and give you a sense of what that is um, and, and to give you a little more information. At the beginning, I know Hani gave you an overview of the definition of trafficking. Uh, which comes from the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, which was passed in 2000. So um, don't feel uh, left out if you don't know much about the TVPA. It's, it is relatively new, younger than the Violence Against Women Act. So uh, we're still catching up here in the, in the, in the human trafficking field uh, in trying to educate uh, society and, and get more information out about what is human trafficking, because it was only even defined in our law in 2000. Um, as a human rights-based uh, approach, and I think for the public health approach, what we focus on in our definition is the definition of who is a victim, um, not the criminal. So there is also in the law a criminal, um, there, are, there are criminal uh, statutes uh, that define who, who is a human trafficker and what are the you know, evidentiary standards. We don't need to focus on that because that's not our job, <laughs> so we don't we don't have to worry about that. We really look at who is a who is a victim and how can we um, get engaged in prevention and services. Um, under labor trafficking, there are really two different kinds of uh, methods of labor trafficking: involuntary involuntary servitude, which really relies on, as Hani mentioned, threats of violence, coercion, and abusive legal process, um, where people use fear tactics, basically, um, or uh, manipulation in order to force someone to continue working. Um, debt bondage is the other type, and that is, as it sounds, using and manipulating debt uh, to force someone to keep working. So the traditional, I think the, the way to think of it most easily is sort of the old-fashioned, what we had in the U.S., the company store scheme where someone uh, has to pay for their job or pay for their uniforms and their housing and their food. Uh, you know, sort of this used to be used by uh, companies previously in the U.S. in sort of the coal industry or, or railroad industry where you were required to live in a company, uh, company town um, and then all of the expenses for all of your food and uh, uh, equipment were taken out of your paycheck so that you ended up actually with no pay at all. Um, and so you're trapped, effectively, at, in that employment. And the importance is that, um, as Hani mentioned, these are invisible chains often. There's, um, it's not necessarily, although traffickers do sometimes use fences and chains and locks um, to, to uh, isolate their victims, often it is it is not. It is much more subtle, and it is threats. And there might be uh, weapons. Um, and uh, sometimes weapons that aren't even used but just displayed. Um, so this might be familiar to all of you from the domestic violence and sexual assault world, right? We don't – victims of domestic violence and sexual assault don't, often aren't actually uh, injured with a weapon. They're just threatened with it and um, just as if that weren't um, terrifying in its own uh, right. So all of this is probably very familiar to you, and that's used by employers in the same way that it is used by, um, by others. Um, and I just wanted to give you sort of two cases from the United States as examples. Um, there was one, it was a poultry processing plant in Iowa that um, held men with intellectual disabilities. They were adult men, they were U.S. citizens, uh, but they were uh, given a job uh, to work in a poultry processing plant in a very rural area, given housing, um, and the housing was started out being not great, and then over decades uh, the men were kept there, were not paid, 
um, were held in poverty, were given no options or opportunities to leave, um, and then worked their entire lives and ended up with only, you know, a couple hundred dollars of savings once they were identified um, by, the, by the EEOC um, and assisted in leaving uh, the plant. So that happened to U.S. citizens. Um, there was another case in Mississippi that happened post-Katrina when uh, workers were being brought in to fix, um, in this case it was uh, to fix the um, oil rigs in the Gulf. Um, and men were brought in from India on legal employment visas, but then held uh, in debt bondage, where they were uh, charged for their food and their housing and their supplies and their tools. Um, and in order to get those visas to come to the U.S. to work, they had they had to pay up front. And so once their all of these deductions came out of their paychecks, they effectively <laughs> pay and were forced to work off this debt in Mississippi. And there was actually a $14 million uh, damage award issued for five of the workers, um, which put the, biz the company that had enslaved them, Signal Processing, out of business. They declared bankruptcy. Um, so this happens in um, lots of different ways in the United States um, and is uh, unfortunately still pervasive. Um, I just wanted to give one other uh, clarification on terminology in the human trafficking field. Um, we often hear, especially in the media, about human trafficking and a kind of a conflation with smuggling, especially now in, uh, coming out of North Africa um, and through, through um, into Europe. When someone uh, crosses state borders unlawfully um, and, and someone who assists people in doing that, uh, even for pay, those are smugglers. Um, the crime of smuggling, of being transported across a border unlawfully, uh, ends at that border. It's you pay someone up front, they take you across the border, uh, they release you on the other side, um, and that's the end of it. Uh, trafficking, on the other hand, um, there is no movement required, as Hani mentioned. It can happen in your own home. Um, and more importantly, there's, there's no end in sight. Um, you're being forced to labor or to engage in conduct for the benefit of the trafficker um, without, you know, a destination or an end point in, in sight. And that is an abuse against the human rights of that individual, um, as opposed to smuggling, which is more about a violation of a physical border uh, and, a, and the autonomy of a government. Um, okay. Excuse so, me for one second, um, G, um, G, I'm getting a background noise, so what we're going to do is I'm going to just mute all the phone lines, because I'm getting a little bit of background noise, and okay. I want to be able to make it easier for everyone to do it, and then I'm going to ask the speakers to unmute their phone um, to do that, so just one second. How's that door? And I'm not having that. Have you got that? Yes, ma'am. Hi, can you hear? There. I think that's there. Jean, are you back on? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to get rid of that, some of the background noise. Thank you. Sure. Um, because they're getting background noise. I'm not sure that it worked, so. <laughs> And that's uh, work. Let me try it again one more time. Sure. And I'm not um, – Megna, can you try to mute everyone, please? I'm not sure. getting it to work. Okay, I apologize, everyone. We're just trying to get rid of the extra extraneous sounds. All and guests now, Jean, have been muted. You can unmute your line by pressing star six. Okay, and Jean, can you press star six and we can have you back on the line. Perfect, okay. Jean. We're back in business? We are back in business. Great. I love technology. Um, um, okay, great. So um, moving on, so we've talked a bit about labor trafficking to, to kind of get everyone up to speed then. That was your um, – now you can all consider yourselves experts on labor trafficking. You've gotten your, your advanced training. Um, and uh, so – 
we can go back now to um, looking again at sort of where trafficking occurs and then what we can do about it. Um, sex trafficking occurs in all sorts of locations, and again, as Hani pointed out, for someone under the age of 18, anyone under the age of 18 engaged in a commercial sex act, and that is where uh, an act, a, a, a sex act, is exchanged for anything of value. So that's cash, that's drugs, that's a place to stay, that's food, that's a cell phone. Anything of value being exchanged for a sex act is, a, is considered trafficking uh, under the Trafficking Victims Protection Act in, in federal law. Um, so that's anyone under the age of 18. If you're over the age of 18, then any exchange of a commercial sex act where there is forced fraud or coercion, right? So here's where we draw the line that someone under the age of 18 cannot consent effectively uh, to a commercial sex act under federal law. State laws are still uh, not quite as um, not quite as advanced, um, and so we still see a lot of arrests of um, youth for prostitution at, at the state level. But uh, under the federal law, uh, we recognize that all of these minors are um, victims of sex trafficking and therefore entitled to services and support. Um, under, and then over the age of 18, uh, uh, where there is force, fraud, or coercion, um, then, then that is considered sex trafficking. Labor trafficking, I gave you two examples, and it also occurs in lots of other places. Um, there are a lot of cases we see with uh, domestic workers, so folks providing child care, health care in someone's private home um, is another um, common location um, where folks are very isolated and individual. So those big cases, like I talked about in the, in the poultry uh, processing plant or in the factory, uh, on, on oil rigs, like, you know, those are larger groups and in some ways easier to identify. Um, and folks are, but individuals are also being trafficked, uh, you know, in people's individual homes. Um, trafficking victims are as diverse as all other crime victims. Um, so again, this is something you're probably all very familiar with. You're probably all nodding your heads uh, dramatically and saying, okay, move on, lady, we know, we know. Um, uh, but I'm afraid that sometimes the media doesn't quite get that and portrays a very specific um, type of victim or type of individual. Um, I do want to point out uh, a really helpful video series um, through the Office for Victims of Crime at the Department of Justice, and that'll be in your list of uh, resources. It's a, it's a video series called The Faces of Human Trafficking that involves some interviews of survivors, a very diverse group of survivors that I think um, can be very helpful in really uh, making, um, making clear the, the great diversity of um, trafficking victims in the United States. Um, the traffickers are equally diverse. Uh, it's, as again, I find myself saying this often, you'll find this very familiar. Um, abusers uh, can be found in all different demographics. Um, it, is, it is unfortunate, uh, the diversity that we find of people willing to um, exploit the vulnerabilities of others for profit. Um, what are the signs of human trafficking? So there are, you know, here I've given you a list that kind of uh, encapsulates across uh, all forms of trafficking, labor and sex trafficking uh, of men and women, U.S. citizens and foreign nationals. What it's really at heart talking about is isolating someone, um, forcing them to engage in some kind of labor or sexual commercial sex act uh, for the benefit of the trafficker. Um, and so it's done in different ways, in different situations, and in different forms of trafficking. Um, but those are the key elements, um, and those are the signs that, that you can sometimes see. Um, and, and for all of those of you uh, working with survivors and working in programs uh, that might be in a place to identify victims, um, here's a list, list of uh, the needs. Um, again, these cut across all types of victims. Um, and again, you're going to find this list very familiar. Um, people are people. We all need a place to live, uh, an education, um, medical, dental, and mental health care, 
food, transportation, uh, these are all very common things. Um, and for someone who's been isolated um, and uh, not paid the value of their labor, um, you can Im well imagine that these are the types of things that they, they need access to. So at the Freedom Network, um, in response to these needs and this issue of human trafficking, um, we are working to build the capacity of service providers across the U.S. Uh, to address these issues. We provide training and technical assistance. Uh, we engage with policymakers. Um, and we collaborate with our members. Most of the programs, uh, most of our members work in very small programs or in organizations that primarily do other types of work. So they might work in refugee resettlement or in uh, a, 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 a sort of general social services organization, and they are the one or two people at their office who focus on human trafficking. Um, so building up that connection um, and strength is, um, is important. Um, Our initiatives on a policy level, I think, overlap extremely well with our understanding of the public health approach to really address this problem without judgment um, and to really try to get at the root causes uh, to engage in primary prevention. We do, a, we do support our members who are providing uh, that, and I'm not a prevention expert, so I hope I'm getting your ter terminology right, but that's the tertiary prevention to work with uh, survivors to ensure that they're not re-victimized. Um, but in addition, we're really trying to get at some of that primary prevention work uh, in looking at the, the um, underlying causes. Um, so we look at expanding labor protections for at-risk populations. Um, currently, uh, minors can work in agriculture, uh, and they can work in dangerous occupations in ways that are their youth working in any other industry are not protected, or youth in other industries are protected. There are uh, limitations on what minors can do in every other industry, but not in agriculture. Um, guest workers have very few protections, um, both in terms of their uh, immigration status and also in terms of labor protections for uh, domestic workers in people's homes. Um, you know, right now there's a real issue of, uh, of addressing the assault on immigrants um, and their their statuses in the United States, um, and supporting community policing and building that collaborative network between immigrant communities and police to ensure that those who are being exploited and abused are able to come forward to seek support um, and to um, and to report the crimes uh, committed against them. Um, supporting our LGBTQ community members to ensure that they are uh, able to find safe spaces, safe, safe spaces to live, to work, to be educated, um, including uh, reauthors with the runaway and homeless youth programs to ensure that they provide safe spaces for youth who are not safe at home. Um, we also work to eliminate the criminalization of victims and at-risk populations. Um, so we support the decriminalization of sex work because those who are afraid to come forward to talk about their experiences and to seek services and support are at high risk of being trafficked. Um, youth who are often uh, in getting arrested with status offenses, especially LGBTQ youth, are often sort of pushed into dangerous work environments um, that can lead to trafficking. Um, so these. Those issues, and finally, um, in expanding the understanding of force, fraud, and coercion in high-risk communities to make sure that people understand the, the use of drug addiction, of um, shaming of sex workers, of the influence of gangs and international labor recruiters to isolate and, um, uh, and to abuse um, and exploit people in our communities. Um, so those are the ways that we see an overlap between a public health approach, not necessarily just from a public health worker perspective, but, but the overall approach of addressing um, those different domains of, of risks and, uh, and um, factors. Well, thank you, Honey. We are running, or because of some of our technical issues, I'm actually going to skip this next question because I want to make sure we have enough time to hear from our next speakers to get a real on-the-ground experience of um, being able to address the issues. So we're going to be starting with um, Kimberly Chang from Asian Health Services over in my hometown of Oakland, California. So, Kimberly, I'm going to give the podium to you. 
Great. Thank you, David and Hani and uh, Jean and Melissa. Really appreciate being here today. Um, I just wanted to let any of the participants know that if you want to use these slides, please feel free to reach out to myself or Rumini, and we'd also love to partner with anybody who is on the, on the call today. So this is Asian Health Services. It's a federally qualified health center in Oakland, California. I've worked there for the past 14 years. Um, Asian Health Services is a typical health center in that it's deeply rooted in the community, and we have a long history of advocacy on behalf of our patients. I've served as a teen clinic physician for many years. And so I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to tell you a story. We've heard a lot of um, uh, theory and statistics, and I want to start with a story. So one night, a uh, patient, DK, uh, came into my clinic. Uh, she was very, very sick. She was young. She was about 15. She had a high fever, rashes all over her body, swollen, painful joints, and a 30-pound weight loss over the past three months. She needed to go to the hospital that night. And... When I looked at her, I looked her straight in the eye and I told her this. She absolutely refused. She was adamant she was not going to the hospital. And she told me, she told me I'd rather die than go back to jail. I didn't understand this connection uh, because I was, you know, doing my doctor thing and just taking care of my patient's needs. And it came to my understanding. She, she let us know that on a previous hospitalization, DK was discharged to jail because there was a bench warrant for her arrest for failing to appear in court on solicitation or prostitution charges. Suffice it to say that BK did not go to the ER that night. And, and really, this was a turning point for me for moving from direct services to prevention and uh, policy work. So I'm going to talk about a little bit about the, the paradigm shift that we're advocating. I tell you the story so that you can understand the framework by which Asian Health Services approaches human trafficking. Historically, the criminal justice system, as you've heard, has been the primary system responding to human trafficking with the goal of prosecuting traffickers. The healthcare system has played a secondary role with the goal of healing victims. We, we like to promote a public health approach to human trafficking for those affected. DK, who was only 15, she really needed medical treatment. But when the system, and when the systems are aligned, there could be optimal solutions, like really good solutions for prosecuting traffickers and healing our patients. But sometimes, sometimes the justice system treats human trafficking victims as criminals, and this prevented DK from getting the help that she needed. So let's talk a little bit about the system differences, because oftentimes the systems are at odds with different goals and different mindsets of how to approach the problem. If we look at the goals, and the, this frame of reference matters if we look at the goals, it influences how we're going to treat the people who've been exploited. You've heard several times today that we can't arrest and prosecute our way out of this problem, especially when we know that only a small minority of those trafficked get access to criminal justice systems of protection and care. So when we look at the goals, the goals are really different. Um, you know, for the criminal justice framework, they want to uphold the laws of the state. For us, on public health side, we want to advance our patients and the population's health. Even in the language and terminology that we use, criminal justice uh, calls uh, the, those affected victims, and we call them patients. They're just people. I heard Jean say early in her presentation, people are people. Yes, they're people. People are people, and, they're all, and, and every single one of us has been a patient at one time or another in our lives. Um, criminal justice is a more defined time frame. We, we look at the issue from a uh, life course theory uh, within the context of community and society, and it's a long-term process. There's a justice orientation on the criminal justice side, and we have a population health orientation. One side is predominantly government-based and on the public health side, community-based or neighborhood-based. And punishment of traffickers can be the goal of the criminal justice framework where we want to prevent harms. You've heard David say over and over that primary prevention is, is the goal of Prevent Connect, and we want to uh, agree with that. Uh, emphatically, prevent harms. So here's a slide of how we uh, conceptualize these differences in the system. And BK, she was caught that night between these two systems, between these two arrows, and she was stuck. She was stuck, and she did not go to the hospital that night, even though her life was at risk. So let me talk a little bit about Community health centers. I love community health centers. I've been working at one since I finished residency uh, 14 years ago, 15 years ago. And community health centers are basically 
in every single community across the country, pretty much. They're, they they were grown out of the civil rights movement. They're private nonprofit. There's 1,300, about 1,300 um, community health center uh, nonprofit organizations with over 9,000 clinical sites in the United States, serving 25 million patients overall. Three of the special things about community health centers are that we provide comprehensive primary care, number one. Number two, we, we serve medically underserved areas and medically underserved uh, populations, the same people who are probably at very high risk of being trafficked. And number three, one of the most important things about community health centers is that we must have, by federal law, a federal mandate, a 51% community board of directors. That means 51% majority have to be patients or users of our system, which translates into us being absolutely accountable and responsible to the needs of our community and the problems that, that uh, occur in our respective uh, areas. Asian Health Services is no different, except that we serve almost 100% racial and ethnic minorities. Across the board, uh, community health centers serve about 62% racial and ethnic minorities. 28% are uninsured even today, and 57% are publicly insured, and 71% live under the federal poverty level. So I want to I want to move to our framework. Let's look at some examples of how a community health center might use a public health model to approach the sex trafficking of a child like CK. So let's define the disease up at the top as human trafficking or domestic minor victims of sex trafficking. And what the patient might experience is on the left side of, of this table. Um, so in primary prevention that's highlighted in this box, a child is not being sex trafficked and is not experiencing any injuries or traumas. So what do we do at Asian Health Services? We have a youth program that does health education in the community about healthy relationships, sexual exploitation, reproductive health issues, health issues overall, and, and we go out into the community and do these kinds of uh, educations. That's one example. In secondary prevention, patients are perhaps in the grooming stage of being trafficked by someone she or he is in love with, Perhaps, but perhaps hasn't experienced, this, for example, a sexually transmitted infection yet or been beaten by a trafficker. A public health intervention that we've developed is a universal screening tool with subsequent training of all, our, of, all of our clinicians to use with steps in a protocol for intervention, steps outlined in an intervention protocol. So we've implemented that at our health center. That's an example of our secondary prevention efforts. Tertiary prevention in active trafficking with health harms actively experienced by our patients, patients presenting crisis, just like BK did that night. And what we do on a policy level is we, we're, we're trying to help uh, develop policies with child welfare, public health, and our law enforcement to intervene on a population level and within our individual, uh, <coughs> excuse me, patient care. And finally, this fourth box, I call it long-term care where you could imagine a child who's been sex trafficked, who's turned 18 years old, might still be being exploited, but no longer is defined as a victim of sex trafficking if, if we can't prove forced fraud or coercion, but that, that, that person still has some health harms. Or you can imagine someone who's been trafficked in the past and has transitioned out of the exploitation, but still might have, uh, as Melissa talked in the ACEs study, made coronary artery disease, mental health issues, post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, anxiety, maybe HIV, or like some of my patients, children from their own trafficking experience from a trafficker. So then how then do we encourage healing and intervene on a population level? So at Asian Health, we look at the long-term primary care relationships as well as what we're doing with an integration of medical and behavioral health within the context of primary care. So I just give you these as some examples of what we're doing on the direct services side. And, and we have a three-pronged programmatic approach to our public health model to trafficking. It consists of policy work on local, federal, uh, state, and federal levels, a research arm to help others understand the issue in the context of our distinct communities, and the provision of direct services from community outreach, pediatric care, teen clinics, school-based health, and wellness programs. And finally, um, a very unique youth development program aimed at at-risk or currently sexually exploited Southeast Asian girls. This was a large majority of affected youth. 
So I'm going to let Rumini Hong take it from here. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Rumini Hong. I am the Community Health Specialist with Mandesre. That means that I coordinate the programming for the young women that come into the space. I identify as Khmer American, so that's the majority language and ethnic group com of the people coming out of Cambodia. Um, I do identify as Southeast Asian American. I was never a part of Monte Sre as a young person, but I was a former patient at Teen Clinic, which Kim has talked about, and Kim was actually my former doctor. Um, so it's really fun and exciting that um, I, I can now call her a colleague and we're doing this together. Um, I have a deep passion for working with young people and in community spaces. I grew up in them as a young person, and so I understand the power and impact of spaces like these. Bandesre is a Khmer term, which means citadel of women. So it's the name of a Cambodian, uh, of an ancient Cambodian ruin with uh, engravings of female deities all over. We're a specific, uh, culturally specific organization, and our name is just one example of that. We have a focus on history, culture, and identity. Um, or in our case, her story, culture and identity. Many of our youth can identify with being Asian Pacific Islander, but may not know or understand the significance of the Southeast Asian identity. So we're not just talking about the geographical location of Southeast Asia, but also what it means that their parents came here um, as a result of the Vietnam War. We are, the way that we do our work is that we, um, our art space, so we explore different mediums of art and expression for learning and healing. Uh, for example, we've wrapped up a session on learning about reproductive health and, and anatomy, and now the young folks are showing a mastery of this information by creating and sewing uh, vulva puppets, which there's a photo in the corner there as an example of um, some of the puppets that was made last year. In previous years, we've had a photo voice project where we'd have topics planned out, we'll talk about it, and then they'll have an assignment to take photos. So if the um, topic for that day was their neighborhood, they might come back with photos of homelessness or liquor stores or even community gardens because that's how um, some of their families sustain themselves. We Talking about uh, sexual exploitation is only a small part of what we do. Uh, the young women are not defined by that experience, if, the, if that's something that they had gone through. Um, so we want to highlight their resiliency and importance of health through our programming. So next slide. Um, <clears throat> one of our programs is SRAI, which stands for Self-Reliant Empowered Individuals. It's actually a Khmer word for woman or girl. So today is one of the day's empowerment programs where young Southeast Asian women are provided with a safe space to learn, teach, and ask questions about Southeast Asian cultures. Uh, when we come together, we share future goals, talk about overcoming violence, learning, learn about women's reproductive health, and identifying and addressing issues of sexism, sexual exploitation, harassment, bullying. But we also move forward through building healthy relationships and determining determining how we empower ourselves as young Southeast Asian women. Uh, we empower young women to be able to make healthy decisions every day for themselves and their bodies. So I often try to take them on field trips. In the past, we've gone to see the vagina monologues and we've gone to dance theater productions on uh, sexual exploitation in Oakland. Most recently, because we also talk a lot about representation, um, and we're in because we're culturally specific, we've gone to see a film at the uh, Center for Asian American uh, Media Film Festival, and in a couple of weeks we'll be going to a Cambodian New Year event. Next slide. Uh, one of our other programs is SOS, which stands for Southeast Asian Unity through Cultural Exploration. It's a peer and intergenerational cooking class where uh, the young women learn about traditional recipes and herbs in traditional Southeast Asian culture. It's a space where older and younger Southeast Asian generations are able to connect 
and foster healthy relationships with one another through cooking and eating traditional foods, um, and also sharing stories of the refugee and resettlement experience. We, in that space, we invite a guest cook to come in. This is a matriarchal elder in the community, someone's mom or someone's grandma or auntie, um, who teaches a, a traditional dish. Um, and so the young women all get to take, take part in that. And while we sit and eat together, uh, she shares her story of surviving the wars in Southeast Asia um, or their experiences resettling in the U.S. So our discussion topics tackle other health issues. We know that trafficking is interrelated to other forms of oppression, such as access to healthy food. And so we try to talk about uh, broader issues that relate back to the young women's lives. So we've also incorporated talking about um, things like the Flint water crisis or Standing Rock. This spring, we're actually going to be working with um, Southeast Asian elders on a gardening project, and we have a cookbook project that's ongoing. So we're recording recipes and capturing their oral histories. It's an important history that the young women don't often learn about in school, and so we see this as a healing, as an important healing space for both uh, the elder and the youth. Um, we're talking about a community that's heavily impacted with by intergenerational trauma. And so the, the get cooks when they're telling their stories, they're talking about they're talking about war, they're talking about genocide. And this is something that maybe some, some of them have never really actually dealt with. And so um some of the young women see people in their family dealing with it in unhealthy ways. And so the young women kind of pick up on that and um experience their own types of trauma. Sometimes uh, the young women are hearing these stories for the first time, and so it helps them to make sense of the situation that they're in. Next slide. Uh, Bong Today is our uh, youth leadership program. It is Khmer for older sister. And um, at the beginning of each academic year, they uh, participate in an intensive uh, leadership training um, where they learn to develop uh, program, uh, develop curriculum and programming. So they help facilitate workshops with me. And each month they also collaborate with another youth leadership organization uh, program uh, within the youth center that we're housed in called the Oakland Youth Empowering Advocates. We plan events, social and cultural events, where they get to practice the skills that they pick up on. Um, and it gives them something to be proud of. So monk studies are mentored by the staff, but also serve as a mentor to current youth participants. Uh, next slide. Okay, this is Kim again. Back to me. I'm just going to give you, I'm, I'm thinking some of you might want to hear what happened to BK. I'll just give you a little resolution to her story. So that night, uh, she didn't go to the hospital. We kind of uh, were very very concerned and worried, uh, freaked out a little bit. But because Bante Sre and the youth program are very embedded within the community, they were able to utilize their community connections and contacts and locate her the next day. The Bante Sre coordinator went to uh, BK, found her, uh, talked to her, convinced her that hospitalization was the best for her health care, um, drove her to the hospital, and she ended up being hospitalized for over two months. She survived. She survived, which is which is a great outcome. Uh, but upon discharge two months later, she was actually discharged to jail. So we have a lot of work to do, and I thank all of you for listening to us and, and for all the work that you're doing. Back to you, David. Well, thank you so much, uh, Kimberly and Rumai, and that was really exciting. And I know we our time is running out, and due to technology, we don't have a little as much. There was a question around demand. Um, that came up, and I don't know, Hani or any of these speakers, if you want to discuss that. We have talked about um, prevention efforts to working on addressing demand. Um, in previous Prevent Connect web conferences, I will post a link in a moment. And I saw Cordelia Anderson, who is, works with Prevent Connect on our um, uh, our child sexual abuse prevention series, Power and Prevention, if you have any resources there. But anything that uh, any of the speakers want to talk about on the demand side?
Well, this is Kim. I would just say that um, demand is, uh, you know, we're we're not necessarily working with demand um, on our on our end, but we do work a little bit with uh, perpetrators because the perpetrators, the traffickers, is not so cut and dry with um, who is being exploited and who's being a trafficker sometimes because sometimes the victims become traffickers themselves. And we've had to work with some um, uh, patients on that end. And this is Great. Honey. Well, I didn't realize you. I was on mute. But um, just to add in there, I think Jean alluded to, this, alluded to this a little bit when we were talking about labor trafficking and some of the supply side of things looking upstream um, to our supply chains, including, you know, the shrimp industry and our demand for um, cheap goods that drives a lot of the, the labor trafficking that we see. Great. We are running out of time. We wanted to ask all of you to be able to share what things are you thinking of doing in our evaluation that will be coming to you in a few minutes. We will be asking this question again. So what are you thinking about doing? It would be great to see if you put that in the text chat. Before we end, though, I want to let to thank all of our guests and our, my co-host, um, Hani, in being able to do this really exciting web conference. We have a lot of people joining us. We have links for all um, – you can get – links to all of the organizations here and the email addresses for all of our speakers. We also do have some additional resources. This will be all on the slides, so you can be able to get copies of them. I saw a great sharing of resources from the text chat. We will take um, some of those um, pieces and put them out as a document that will be available on the Prevent Connect website, so that will be able to be available for all of you. We are at our time, so I want to really um, – Hani, thank you for joining us for co-hosting today, and thank all of our speakers thank for you, sharing David. this. And most of all, thanks to the audience for sharing all of your questions and thoughts as we begin and continue this conversation about using public health to prevent um, many forms of violence and how we can address human trafficking. So this concludes today's Prevent, Connect, and Heal Trafficking web conference. We'll keep the text chat open for another minute or two so you can share any of your resources. Thank you so much, and we look forward to seeing you again on a future Prevent, Connect web conference.